Welcome to the Elite BSC Podcast, where our entire focus is helping commercial janitorial contractors succeed. You want a growing company, a thriving team, and healthy profits, and we are here to help. My name is Jordan Tong. I'm the founder of Elite BSC, a company dedicated to helping janitorial companies grow and thrive. I also serve as CEO and one of the owners of France Building Services. France is a janitorial company employing nearly 600 people. Since 2007, we grew from 1.5 million to more than 20 million in annual revenue and built what I think is one of the best teams in the world. The goal of Elite BSC in this podcast is to give owners in the industry a vision of where their company can be and the information and tools to get there. I want to share what I have learned over the years to make this a reality for you. Hey guys, this is Jordan Tong here with Elite BSC Podcast. So today I have, I'm a little behind getting some podcasts recorded. Um, I actually had surgery on my shoulder a few days ago and that's, it was a minor surgery, but it still just kind of knocked me out of my rhythm and made working um, a, a little bit more difficult and challenging for me. Uh, so anyway, hopefully I'm, I'm on the mend and going to get back in the swing of things. So today what I have got for you is it's a recording of a talk that Jeff Carmen, um, who, again, for those of you who don't know, he's s- sort of my um, – the person that oversees writing content and managing our LEBSC group and, you know, leading training sessions and that sort of thing. He's sort of the creator behind a lot of the content we do in our workshops. And Jeff was in sales and operations here, leading both of those things at, at two different times uh, in our cleaning company. And this particular uh, talk is one that we've given, that he has given numerous times at at our workshops, our sales workshops in particular. And, and I guess to get under the whole thing, the the question he's answering is, is why people buy. And it's often for reasons that we don't realize. Like we say people are looking for, you know, A, B, and C, and it's really X, Y, and Z that they're looking for. And there's some good research on this, and, and Jeff sort of digs into some of that and tells some good anecdotal stories. And um, it's a it's a fun session to listen to, and and it's helpful. It's really helpful, and it helps you think about how you frame the the question of building your sales process and what your value adds are and that sort of thing. So I won't bore you anymore with uh, some explanations about it. I will let's dive right in and uh, and hear this talk from from Jeff from our most recent sales workshop. I want to draw your attention uh, to that quote uh, on the top of page three. That that guy who's in that picture is a guy named Fred Reicheld. He wrote that book called Winning on Purpose: Unbeatable Strategy of Loving Customers. Great book. I would encourage you to read it. It's kind of um, I would rank it up there with good to great in terms of business books. It's just, it's, it's an excellent book, but you'll see him. I mean, he works for a company called Bain and Company, actually a Utah company. Uh, Mitt Romney actually was, uh, was the CEO of that company, kind of brought him back. But, um, but anyway, they are the people who developed, uh, the net promoter score, uh, uh, a way to a customer service or a customer satisfaction survey. And so they spent a lot of time in customer value and talking about that. So that'll come back up here uh, in just a minute. So again, we consistently delivering on customer value is the key to creating long-term customer loyalty and driving also long-term customer growth. So like in his quote, it says, all stakeholders win when customer loyalty is the focus or enriching customers' lives. And that means the owners of the company and the employees and the customer and everybody around. So this idea of creating loyalty, which will, I mean, creating loyalty goes back to, we have to provide what the customer truly values. And so the question then is, is what do customers value? Uh, And sometimes it's very difficult to discover what that is, but we're gonna walk through that I'm going to kind of kind of move through that. So we're going to dive off into the subject. Stay with me. We're going to use a little case study, and we're going to use a case study of this boy right here. Are you familiar with this? This is the Stanley Quencher. It comes in 30 ounce and 40 ounce sizes. Are you pretty familiar with that? Familiar with this thing? So it's kind of a phenomenon. It's a uh, so let me go through a few things here. So the first picture here. 
this is actually people waiting in line. Uh, Target had a special Valentine's quencher uh, that people waited in line overnight uh, to get this thing. And in most stores, they sold out in five minutes. Uh, they actually also, in some stores, there were fights that broke out over the Stanley quencher. This is a lady who posted on Instagram. This is her collection. She had a little special area in her home where she set up her collection of Stanley quenchers. Yep. This is, uh, uh, this is uh, Lainey Wilson, country music singer, and that in front of her is the limited edition Watermelon Moonshine 40-ounce quencher. Uh, this is interesting. Uh, this last picture is really interesting. So this is a lady named Danielle. Danielle's driving a Kia Sorento, and the thing catches on fire, which is not good for customer value on the Kia side, but that's not part of the story. So her car catches on fire. She's lucky she made it out. The next day, she goes out to the car, and she does a TikTok video, and she says, I know everybody is worried about the tumbler falling over in your car and making a mess, but what happens if it melts? And she picks it up and goes, there's ice still in it. So the Stanley, the Stanley quencher had survived that. And so Stanley uh, sent her a replacement quencher and also bought her a new car. So the Stanley quencher is every place. And so here's an interesting, uh, a couple of interesting facts. There have been 70 mi million viewers on Instagram and also from a revenue standpoint, uh, yeah, 275% growth in those things year over year. And in their uh, hydration, hydration category, which would include thermoses, and we'll talk about that in just a minute, 215% growth. And so you ask yourself the question, is it the quality of the cup? Is it that good of a cup that you can have all of these things that are going on? And the, and the answer is, there's some of that, but there's a, there's a little bit deeper story. So let's go back and look a little bit at the history. So these things are images that probably if, you, uh, if you've been around for quite a while, you remember the old Stanley Thermos. And, and reading that quote, it says that they are historically, they targeted workmen and those camping and hunting. And notice what it says, that their product, even in their marketing, resonates with veteran police officers or a retired army soldier. And so that was their market for years. They've been around about 100, a little over 100 years, and that's been their market. Their focus was just these guys. And so you ask yourself a question, how did you go from there to there? Because this thing is selling a whole lot more than those things. But the, the thermos is also selling, and the, these have helped the thermos sell, but that's, a, that's another part of it. So how did we move here? And so as I researched this, I, I wanted just, I, I think this is where it started, and this is where they, they think. The, the three ladies in the picture are Ashley, Taylor, and Lindley, and they run a website called The Buy Guide, B-U-Y, uh, B-U-Y Guide. And so what this is, is it's kind of like a consumer report uh, website for, for ladies. And so ladies go on there, and so if you go on, they, they've got children's clothing, uh, uh, ladies' clothing, uh, housewares, all that kind of stuff. So anything a lady would want, they'll buy it. They'll research it, they'll, they'll find the best in the product, they'll put it out there on the website, and then they'll say, hey, if you'd like to buy something, you just click on this link and it'll go where it is on, on Amazon. So on November 17th of 2017, November 17th of 2017, that's hard to say, um, they posted this on Instagram. So one of the ladies bought the, bought the quencher and then bought two more for the friends, and they post that, hey, if you're gonna buy if you want a mug, this one's to buy. And so they had a tremendous amount of response to that, and they were asking where could you get it. And, and so these ladies, being entrepreneurial, called the Stanley Company and said, hey, we've got this thing going on our Instagram account and on our, and on, uh, on our website, and we'd like to partner with you. I think that's a thing now with influencers that they, they get clicks and people go to the website, they get paid. Well, Stanley goes, Stanley came and he goes, we don't even know what you're talking about. We don't have arrangements like that. And they said, well, there's a lot of ladies that are coming and wanting to buy these things. And they said, well, we don't, we don't really know what to tell you. You could place a, a wholesale order if you wanted. And so they did. And they purchased 5,000 of them. And they sold in five days. And so they called Stanley again and said, 
hey, I'm telling you, five days they sold out, and they said, that sounds great, but we don't know what to do with that. Meanwhile, the lady that's on the far, my left, um, who works for, her name's Lauren, who works for Stanley, began to see this going on. And so she's going to meetings and saying, hey, we gotta, we gotta look at these ladies. I mean, there's something out there. But the men in the room, I think, ignored her. And so these ladies ordered 10,000 quenchers, and they sold out in less than five days. And so finally, they got linked up. This is a picture of them getting together. And this is where it all kind of began, is this groundswell of ladies who were following these quenchers and needed to get their hands on them. So that's really kind of where it gets started. So still, we haven't answered the question, what is so special about these quenchers? And where is the value? So if you go to their website, this is what you'll see. And so you can read through that, and it talks about the handle, and it talks about keeping ice cold, and a various and sundry other things. But you could go to almost any website, or you could go to TJ Maxx and find one for $10 that is almost the exact same product. It might not keep ice cold as long as theirs, but it's a, it's a similar product. And so you, you think, well, that's not where the value is. So let's dig just a little bit deeper. Um, and this is it. By the way, the, this product costs between $40 and $50. Um, so let's look at some customer research uh, that went on about this. And, and notice these quotes. The first one says this. Um, I've got it here. Nobody talks about, listen to this, the joy that people have when they open their cabinets and see the multitude of these water bottles. The joy, the joy that people, the joy that people get when they look and they see their quenchers in their cabinet. Now that's speaking to something a little deeper than the handle and the, and the straw that won't leak. Let's look at this one. This one's even better, I think. The Stanley Tumbler not only has good technical foundation, so it's a good quality product with a handle and the ability to fit securely in a cup holder. So that's a nice thing. It doesn't fall over. It's good. It also comes in colors, and that goes to the emotional needs of people like me that thinks about the cup much more as an accessory and not just a water bottle. So the cup is a, an accessory like a purse or a pair of shoes that goes with their outfit. It goes on to say, I want, I want the optionality to determine what is the one I want and what I want to carry with me today as I go around my daily chores or go to my tel Peloton classes. So again, we can see something that's much, much deeper. And I, I've used this anal a different analogy before. The same would apply, say, with Yeti coolers. The same thing. You can buy a Yeti cooler, you can buy styrofoam, and you can spend, uh, certainly the Yeti keeps ice a, longer, a bit longer, but there's a big chasm in the price of those things. OK, so let's talk about what Bain & Company. I talked about Bain & Company. Um, and they did some research, and the output of their work is what you see on the screen. And to the, here is, is the, what they came up with from the research. It's called the Business to Consumer uh, Pyramid. In your books, you've got the B2B that they came up with, but right now we're just talking about the Business to Consumer. And they categorize consumer feedback into 30 value elements that you see here on the right. And it's, it's, it's much like Maslow's uh, hierarchy of needs. And so what they noticed was that there was, there's certainly functional elements. And so when we as consumers go out to buy products, we're looking for these things just initially. And so we, you really can't have long-term success in any market if you don't have a quality product. And so like with the, with the tumbler, I mean, it's a quality product. It keeps ice cold even through a car fire, apparently. It's got a good handle, it doesn't spill, so it's got some quality. So it's, it's got some things here that we'll talk about. Then the next level is emotional needs, and you can see some of those things. But what, what Bain and Company said is, is that companies that do really well score on a lot of these value elements, and they also score on value elements more to the top of the pyramid. And again, like Maslow's, that's kind of self-actualization, the, the things that are emotional, that, that dive deeper into, the, into your soul. Those are the things. So when companies can deliver on those things, they generate more customer loyalty and generate more long-term revenue. Now stay with me because I'm going to go, we're going to talk about janitorial in just a minute, but this is important. So when you think about this particular product, they are hitting on those elements. And so they've got good quality, they've got variety of colors, it avoids hassle so it doesn't tip over in your car. 
It's also got some amount of therapeutic value, having those things, buying one, collecting them. It's fun and it's entertaining. It's attractive and the design is good. And so though there's, those are things that are important. So they're scoring on a lot of value elements. I went to their site just the other day and this was the first comment that popped up. Read what it says. Preparing his water bottle, talking about her husband, reminds me of making my father's coffee in the old Stanley original thermos. And so they score on this as well, nostalgia. But read, think through that. I mean, it's amazing that this lady, that's what came to her mind. My dad is a car, he loves cars. He told me the other day, he's, he's getting older now, so he drives a Toyota Camry. And he said he's trading his car. And I said, well, you hadn't had it very long. And he's going, oh, it's got about 16,000 miles on it. I'm like, my gosh, I drive 16,000 miles in four months. But anyway, he was a Corvette. He liked cars. So he, for several years, he was buying Corvettes and he was talking about it. And he told me one day, just with a seriousness, he goes, man, he said, uh, we called our grandfather Daddy J. His name was James. He said, man, Daddy J would have loved to have ridden in this car. Man, he was a car man. And he said, every time I'm driving this, I think about your grandfather. I'm thinking, man, that's deeper than the thing will just run fast. And, but running fast is a value element. But that idea that that connected him, that car in some way connected him with his father meant there was a lot of value there uh, to him in that regard. So let's look at this. So here's where the value elements the deeper, deeper value elements that we've been talking about. There's a certain amount of badge value. There's a certain amount of carrying a Stanley quencher. Uh, I go to Orange Theory and about six or seven ladies every morning, they got that big, I mean, it's huge. Does anybody have one? Does anybody have one here? Yeah, you have one? Three. Yeah, yeah, there you go. Yeah, there you go, there you go. So, so anyway, it's the idea, it's, it's the idea of this badge value. And it, I'll go back here, I meant to, I meant to, mention that. Those places like Chick-fil-A, um, uh, Harley-Davidson, Nike, they've all done that. It's kind of that idea that, that there's badge value associated with having these products. And last I'm sorry. And then here's the last one, affiliation and belonging. That's where you're getting up into that real emotional piece where people are, you're really drawing the people in and creating loyalty to your brand. And so clearly the Stanley company has done that. And it's amazing to think that for the longest time, these, these folks sold thermoses to guys to, going on work sites and going on a hunting trip and going on a camping trip. And it took these kind of these four ladies to come along and light a fire. And now they, they are where they are now. Um, let me see what I got here. So now we'll talk about the B2B pyramid, which is in your book on page four. Um, so Bain and Company uh, also, when they finished their work uh, uh, surveying consumers, they did the same thing. So they went over into the business community and they asked the same question. So what are the motivators? What are the things that are kind of the deeper value of, of, of finding these things? And I meant to mention on that previous slide, one of the things that's challenging about customer, true customer value is typically it's, it's hard to draw out of people. And so if you were to ask a lady why she buys a quencher, or if you were to ask somebody why they bought a Yeti cooler, or why somebody bought a Toyota Camry, for instance, just some product, they're typically, a Toyota Camry purchaser is probably not gonna say, I bought that Camry because I wanna be a good dad and a good father. But people are buying Camrys at its deeper level because they wanna be a good husband or be a good father because they want to put their kid or their wife in a, in a car that's not going to break down and it's going to be safe. That's the deeper value. And so, again, it's hard to, it's hard to find that. And so Bain and Company went out and they had to do, there's a te technique called laddering where you ask questions and you just probe deeper and deeper and deeper. And they did this with business to business buyers. And the result of that is what's on page four in your book. And I'm going to describe these a bit. Um, and that's on page five. So you can flip over to page five. And you can see they've added an element that was not on the business to consumer side. It's uh, called table stakes. Notice that at the very bottom. So that's an that's a added uh, part of the pyramid uh, when they put the business to business uh, pyramid together. Let me, I need to do this real quick. So let's talk about that. So, so table stakes, that's at the bottom of the pyramid. These address the bare necessities. You can, under, you can highlight bare necessities if you want. It's the bare necessities of doing business with a company. And you must, here's the idea why it's called table stakes, kind of like a poker game and having $10, but I don't think there's $10 tables. It's the $50 down. It's what you have to have 
minimum in order to sit at the table. That's why they call it table stakes. Um, and so these are elements like uh, acceptable price, and down there at the bottom on your on that on page four, uh, ethical standards. It's meeting standards. It's I, I've, I've joked. It's like selling a car and going, hey, it's got windows and doors and tires. We, yeah, it should. It's it's a car. And so these are the minimum things that, and we'll, we're going to go through some examples from from our perspective, from a janitorial perspective. But those are table stakes. Very objective. Very objective. The second level is functional value, and you can see some elements there. And I've circled a couple that are, that are on your page because these are things that we can deliver as janitorial companies. So these address, I'd highlight service performance, and they tend to be very objective. And so I, I wrote here as a note, uh, service is either good or bad. Now, we might say we're providing good service and the customer thinks it's bad, and what the customer thinks is what matters. And so, so it's, it's really objective, tends to be more objective. Uh, I would tell you that, that folks in our industry, including our company as well, France, most of us tend to focus our energy on these elements. That's, that's where, we, where we land. So for instance, and we'll talk about this in messaging, we, t we, we talk about our and do our inspections. And I'm telling you as a customer, former customer of a janitorial company, I could care less about inspections. It's, it's like going to the Toyota dealership and them saying, hey, let me show you how we quality inspect the cars that comes off the line. I'm like, I don't really care. I just want to drive a car. That's what's important to me. I want to have something that's good for my family. Functional value for janitorial companies, it's generally value. We can, we can though, create these value elements. And it's important as we talk about these value elements, but it's also important that we deliver on these as well. So as a janitorial company, we can deliver on good service quality. We ought to build our service model around providing quality service and also scalability. And so when I mean scale scalability, that is that we can provide service in other areas of your company. We can provide more services. The next level up, this is where you begin when we can deliver as companies, when we can deliver on these values, and we'll talk about in the messaging how we talk about them, but when we can deliver on these value elements, we begin to create more cust customer loyalty. So these address ease of doing business needs. Elements in this level are both, you can highlight both objective and subjective. So there's a little bit of both in these. We can deliver, janitorial companies in my opinion, we can deliver on decreasing hassles, which is important. So you can see one side of the uh, ease of doing business is productivity. In the middle, there's access, and the other side is the relationship. All very important. Um, we can provide time savings, so when we're doing our work well, we save that person time because they don't have to go up and, and respond to a complaint. Uh, over on the relationship side, these are all things that we can, we can be committed to their business. We can provide stability. That's where you can bring into your messaging if you're been in business for 35 years, you can use that to say, you know, we want to be a stable partner with you uh, as we've been for the past 35 years. Um, cultural fit, but it's those go up to the next level. If, if we go up to individual and inspirational value, this is where um, I think we as janitorial companies really need to focus our time and energy. Uh, is delivering on these value elements, and from a, biz from a business growth or a sales perspective, it's talking about these a lot. Um, and these are priorities that are both personal and professional. And that was one thing that's kind of interesting about this is, is that many times when we're selling to businesses, we think we're selling to a business. But a business is just a collection of people, and we're dealing with the, a buyer or a, a, you know, a practice manager in a medical practice, these folks have personal goals and personal values that we need to address. Uh, these are elements, uh, the second point, these are highly subjective, highly subjective. Um, and so janitorial companies, I, what, what I would say is, is that the three areas or the three value elements that we should latch onto because of, and we'll talk about this much more as we go through, is, is providing elements in terms of reduced anxiety. And so you think about the person who selects our company uh, to come in and, and perform janitorial work. Unlike test driving a car, uh, or even uh, somebody who's maybe even at a, at a, at a commercial building or a, a manufacturing facility, even much more than the landscaping folks who are, who are, who are, who are providing service, we are a, we're a, a service that you can't just try 
for a week and then say, well, I'll bring somebody else in here. It's really a commitment. And so you're bringing on, when, when people hire us, they're, they're kind of committing. Oops, uh, I'm not sure what happened there. Uh, that's okay. Uh, let's turn the TV off for right now. Yeah, there you go. So um, when they hire us, they're making a commitment. And so that person or persons in that building, they've made a decision and they're putting their personal stake on the line when they bring us in. And so if we do a poor job, then that person who works there, who selected us, their colleagues and potentially their boss looks at them and says, well, your decision making isn't very good. Who's the person that picked this cleaning company? They're worse than the last one we had. On the flip side, when we go in and do a really good job, people begin to notice. People will say, gosh, the restrooms are cleaner than they've ever been. You know, the break room used to be filthy. And now we go in, the tables are clean, everything's stocked, the microwaves are clean. I don't go in, there's not junk flung all over the inside of the microwave. You know, my trash gets emptied almost every night. Everything's dusted. And so over time, what people say is, is, hey, good job. And sometimes the boss will even come down and go, hey, that cleaning company is doing a great job. Reputational assurance. That's, the, that's one of those that's, that's, that's reduced anxiety and reputational assurance. Let me talk about reduced anxiety for a minute. Many times, and I'm sure you've heard this too, that people will say, I want to leave the office, or they'll say something like this. I want to leave the office, or I want to leave the wherever I work, every night, and I don't want to have to think that I'm going to come in tomorrow morning and the janitorial company didn't show up. I just want to go to my kid's ball game and not think about the janitorial services. And in our industry, unfortunately, there's people that do that, that they just don't have the, the, the service model in place or the systems in place to ensure that that doesn't happen. And so there's a great deal of anxiety that comes along also with the fact that this work is going to get done in a timely manner and it's going to be done well. And then lastly, and it's down just a little bit, uh, it's down in the ease of doing business. Nope, let's go back to social responsibility. At the very top, at the very, very top, sometimes I think our industry has, I think COVID was an opportunity for us to bounce on up into social responsibility. And so we serve a lot of manufacturing facilities and as part of what we did, we kept the place disinfected, which allowed them to keep the factory open and keep people in jobs. And so we even heard some people say, man, we appreciate, because we had to pour a bunch of people in that. We appreciate what you guys did to come in here and take care of all our disinfecting. Because we, I mean, we couldn't have kept the place open if you all weren't doing that. The, the guidelines were so tight that what you did really helped us keep, keep the plant moving. And so Again, I don't, it's tough for us to get up there a whole lot, but I do think there's some environments that we work in that the cleanliness of the building and the disinfecting uh, allows them to keep their business moving and keep it moving forward. Uh, there's also some things, I think, uh, that are associated with reputational assurance that might tie into the company, uh, especially companies who face the public. And so when they come in, the way the building look is a part of their brand. I work for a medical practice, and so when people came into the lobby, it was really important for the lobbies to look clean. When they went into the exam rooms, exam rooms were clean. If, person, if you've ever been to a doctor's office, uh, a physician's office where there's, you know, there's dust bunnies on the floor and you see things, you're like, golly, this is, this, I'm not sure I'm coming back here. But you go into most doctor's offices and they're, they're really clean. And so uh, that's, some, that's all of those things, and this, I'll, I'll, I'll finish up with this, is, when we are going about doing our work, it's not enough to say we provide quality work. It, that's a part of it. But when we can dive in and say, hey, you know, I, I want you to stay focused on the things that you do best, Mr. or Mrs. Medical Practice Manager, and you just leave the cleaning to us. You leave that to us and we'll take care of those things. And so we're gonna talk about that much more when we talk about messaging and how we do messaging. But this common thread, we talked about two common threads last night in our one thread is creating value, and we're going to talk about that the whole time, and the other is creating loyalty and just loving and serving customers well. And I think we do both of those when we, when we hone in on this value. If you found the information in this podcast helpful, please like and subscribe on whatever podcast platform that you're using. If you would like more resources or help to grow your cleaning company, head over to EliteBSC.com. We have loads of articles, videos, free tools, coaching options, and a lot more. If your company is greater than 500K in revenue and you want to take your learning experience to the next level, check out our mastermind group. 
You can learn more about that at EliteBSC.com slash mastermind.